So anyway, uh, the fourth turning, the book, it's, it talks about the cyclical events that happen in every uh, generation, which is comprised of about 80 years. Uh, and they say that this is repeated throughout history. Um, how they came across this as being racist from Bannon and that these this book represented that, I really don't know because that's not, truly not what this book is about. Um, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, it talks about the, the stages of, of uh, creation, um, euphoria, innovation, and dissension, and then uh, the complete uh, uh, destruction of each generation. How they they begin with what they call, uh, let me do it here, the turning, uh, the first turning they call is post-crisis. It happens after a catastrophe uh, such as World War or the Civil War or the uh, Revolutionary War. These are called the crises, and then the first turning begins after these crises take place. It's the it's the uh, next phase of of the cycle, and uh, they say that each phase will last twenty years. The first uh, is the turning. The first turning is the post crisis. It is when uh, after whatever catastrophe happens, war, uh, whatever, uh, social crisis, uh, uh, the, the monetary crisis, collapse, things like this. Uh, it is the, the coming together after, the rebuilding, the, the rethinking. Um, it is the birth of the next uh, generations. The second is the awakening, uh, the second turning, is considered uh, the awakening, the spiritual awakening, when people become aware um, and are, yes, thank you, Anon2712. Uh, that's one of them. The other one that I have is um, from the C-SPAN. There's quite a few. Uh, the third is the unraveling uh, of no order. That's where we're at, I think, right now, or, or it has already begun, I think they say. Um, the unraveling of the social order, the unraveling of, of the uh, political order and such. And the fourth is uh, the supply uh, is gone, the demand uh, is greater, and uh, lack of order, demand for order is high because order breaks down and there's no more structure in government, there's no more order, uh, everything is chaotic. And, and uh, we are either in the third or the fourth. I think they say we're in the fourth turning now. Each one, they say, lasts about 20 years. So they're stating that uh, by the, the mid to late 20s of this century that we will have completed the fourth turning. Now, I don't know what what the beep is with this book. I don't know why there is such a, a aversion to, uh, uh, in fact, I find it uh, a very telling intellectual look at the cyclical generations and how they are constructed. Yes, that's the one. Um, so I'm not sure exactly uh, what they're trying to, to portray in this. All right, I'm going to bring Barbara Three Crow on with us. Hey, Barb. Hi there. Oh, what a day, what a day, you know? Yeah. What I was saying, you know, when we, uh, when I came on the show, I told him that we wanted to talk about uh, Bannon and what we think and all. Yeah. Um, I can't, I have looked, and I have spent time, <sighs> and I have looked at many, many videos today um, on my son's Xbox uh, or YouTube trying to find the racist comments that Bannon has said, and I can't find them. I can find videos that say here are his racist comments, but it, they don't actually show Bannon saying these. Uh, they show a picture of him talking, 
but they print out what he's saying. So I can't, I can't say, right. you know. But I did right. find this book on the fourth turning. Yes, that's one that he he's really pushing that. That's but, his big, that's yeah, his but, big interest is that fourth turning, right? But I'm not finding I I find this uh, book so far to be intriguing and and pretty uh, pretty well thought yep. out and worked out. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that it's uh it, like I said to you, it's pretty much I feel along the lines of what you and I have been talking about. The only thing is is um, the statements made. Now I'm not saying by him. But people that are watching what he's doing, of course, or making note of this fourth turning and his discussing this, and I didn't watch him discussing this, but if, that it's about, you know, the uh, religious uh, fundamentalists' uh, uh, perception or, or wanting, you know, that this is the fourth turning is about the Armageddon, that no. this is... This is what he, I think I saw, actually did see him speaking on that. Right. But, now, the book itself, the book itself does not concern itself in a religious nature that I've seen so far. Uh, right. What it deals with is historical perspective of generations and the stages of these generations. Uh, the, the beginning, they call them turns, the first, second, third, and yeah. fourth 20-year uh, increments of how a generation begins and uh, self-destructs, so to speak. But at the end, the guy does say you have two ways. It's not Armageddon. It could be. But then again, it could be a greater awakening, a more um, enlightening. It could bring in a more enlightened society after that, you know? Well, here's the thing. He did, I did hear him uh, or read or hear him speak, and he talks about, the wars that speak about these the the great turnings, but he missed the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. He's not including the Vietnam War at all. Right, he was um, an American, wasn't he? No, he talked about World War Two, World War One. Um, you know the three wars or what? He t talked about the three wars. He missed the Vietnam War. He didn't. He, Bannon. Yeah. He completely, um, okay. you know. Omitted that. So, oh, actually, but according... If you look at the government, they, they said it was a police action. It wasn't a war. Oh, uh, yeah, really? It tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Vietnam, war, Vietnam was a police action? Well, it started out that way. They tried to portray it at that like that, yeah. Yeah, because the people didn't want war. And, uh, yeah, it's like what they said when we went over to Iraq. It wasn't wasn't a war, it was an operation, it was an Iraqi freedom thing, it wasn't a war, but it was a war, you know, yeah. Well, I'm looking at, you know, we're, you and I have talked about um, really um, being vigilant about truth, mm -hmm. right, and not hearsay right. or somebody else's perspective who said so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that, right? Exactly. There's a lot of stuff flying around, accusations and so on, that so, somebody said this and somebody said that, or so-and-so's a racist, and we've been looking at that. Mm -hmm. You know, now, just looking at, um, you know, at the this piece, this four, fourth turnings or the... The idea supposedly goes back to the ancient Greeks. You know, now here's, I'm just looking at this headline. This is a business insider headline that says that, uh, Bannon is, um, obsessed with this fourth turning. Bannon, all right, Time Magazine and in the piece, he was interviewed, Bannon, it is revealed that Bannon deeply believes in a theory about America's future laid out in a book called The Fourth Turning, What Cycles of History Tell Us About America's Next Rendezvous with Destiny. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, are you with me? Yeah. Um, so the era of change is known as the fourth turning and Bannon, like Strauss and Howe, I guess maybe they're the authors, I don't know, believes we are in the midst of a fourth turning right now. 
According to the book, the last two fourth turnings that America experienced, and here he goes, oh, Civil War and the Reconstruction, and then the Great Depression and World War II before that, it was the Revolutionary War. And he it does exclude, you know. So we have Civil War, uh, Great Depression, World War II, and the Revolution. That's four wars. Think, yeah, and I think he's referencing wars that America has been a part of. This uh, fourth turning seems to be the the uh, uh, authors seem to be concentrating, or either Bannon is concentrating on this being strictly uh, American interpretation. I don't know. But World War II, we were in Europe. Yeah. But right? So, I mean, right. yeah. That's what I'm saying. They're saying the wars that, that America was directly involved in. I don't know. I don't know. Well, we were directly involved, yeah. Ex eliminated the Vietnam War. Right. So all these were marked by periods of dread and decay in which the American people were forced to unite to rebuild a new future, but only after a massive conflict in which many lives were lost. It all starts with a catalyst event, and then there's a period of region, regeneracy. After that, there is a defining climax in which a war for the old order is fought, and then finally there is a resolution in which the new world order is, is stabilized. This is where Bannon's obsession with the book should cause concern. Okay, now this is the, the author's perspective here again. He believes that for the new world order to rise, there must be a massive reckoning that we will soon reach our climax conflict. In the White House, he has shown that he is willing to advise Trump to enact policies that will disrupt our current order to bring about what he perceives as a necessary new one. He encourages breaking down political and economic alliances and turning away from traditional American principles to cause chaos. There's that word again. So in that way, Bannon seems to be trying to bring about the fourth turning. This again, you know, I, I haven't heard him speak. Right, and and what I what I'm hearing here, the author is is putting in supposition because uh, right away uh, there is no new world order coming out of this book. They're not talking in any way of this coming to a new world order. What they're saying is this has happened over and over and over and over again in the history of man, and that uh, this is a cyclical thing, and every fourth turning will bring in a new uh, way of doing things. It's not yeah, it, that it's going it, to be a new world order. It, exactly. So, so the thing is, he did tell Vanity Fair last summer that Trump was a blunt instrument for us. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. Um, they're using him for a blunt well, isn't instrument. Isn't it like a, a cudgel? You know, like a, a yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> and he Bad he easy. said. Okay, but putting a fourth turning lens on Trump's policies certainly give them a great deal of context, and Banyan believes that the catalyst for the fourth turning has already happened, the financial crisis. Thank you, honey. That's what he's, that's what he must have, you know, he must be feeling that or saying that. So now we are in the regeneracy, he believes. And that period is one of isolationism, one of infrastructure building, and of strong centralized government power, and a reimagination of the economy. So And Trump is in lockstep with this. With that, yeah. And yeah. Banyan believes in authoritarian politics as preparation for a massive conflict between East and West, whether East means the Middle East or, or China. Over the years, Banyan has unsuccessfully tried to pressure historians such as Professor David Kaiser to say the same thing. And this is the quote from Time magazine. Um I guess that's David Kaiser. I remember him saying, Banyan, well, look, you have the American Revolution, and then you have the Civil War, which was bigger than the Revolution, and you have the Second World War, which is bigger than the Civil War. Um, he wanted me to say that on camera, and I was not willing. So he, how too, was also struck by what he calls Banyan's rather severe outlook on what our nation is going through. Banyan noted repeatedly on his radio show that we're at war with radical jihadists in places around the world. He said this is a global existential war that likely will become a major shooting war in the Middle East again. 
War with China may also be looming, he has said. This conviction is central to the Breitbart mission, which is his, he's no longer there with Breitbart, but he explained in November 2015, our but big belief. Bannon nor Trump were uh, because of, of China moving in uh, during the, the uh, Bush era and trying to usurp their authority over Japan. Uh, and and uh, uh, Hong Kong, which started this all, and they were not uh, there when China started building these islands and and uh, putting. Men no, but they're look. I guess he's looking at this stuff. Well, yeah, and so that to me though, what I'm saying is 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 Bannon was actually he could have been right on his assumptions there because right. we are looking at just exactly that. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And, and Bannon said on November 2015, he explained, our big belief, one of our central organizing principles at the site is that we're at war. He keeps saying that. Um, and the reality of repetition. I'm trying to find what else he said here. Uh, the authors, so the authors of the book that Bannon, I think, is, is um, talking about, the fourth turning, he says, it is here where Strauss and Howe fail in their work and here where Bannon gets caught in their failure. The authors mention in passing that the event that brings us into a crisis could be as ominous as a financial crisis or as ordinary as a national election. Um, the fourth turning of the Civil War and Reconstruction played out differently than the fourth turning afterward, the Depression and World War II. But Strauss and Howe fail to recognize that difference in their description of the fourth turning to come. They forget that no two turnings are alike. Instead, they get trapped thinking that the last catalyst, the Great Depression, a financial crisis, was the next one as well, and Bannon does too. And that, you know, um, I don't know, but... I know one thing that's interesting that I got off of that video is that when Strauss is talking, or it might have been uh, uh, Neil Howe, uh, was talking about this, they did mention that in the fourth turning that ignorance would rule the day, so to speak, in, in the leaders. You know, well, yeah. I think we're there. <laughs> well, I do. I, you're, I think you're right. And here's more on the... Uh, this is, a, you know, the writer saying um, the... Or the the person who's writing this article says, so perhaps there is a fourth turning to come, but Bannon is not an architect of its initiation, because according to Howe and Strauss, unity is the defining feature of the regeneracy. It is what allows leaders during a crisis to become authoritarian, severe, unyielding, in commanding resources in order to rebuild society. And this is what allowed FDR to command the full force of government to put people back to work. The stars of the fourth turning are baby boomers and millennial boomers are the ideal ideologues who lead our country into conflict through folly. Millennials are cast as the young heroes that bring them out of it. And once the catalyst event takes place, Strauss and Howe describe a situation in which America coalesces under one leader, a boomer gray warrior who will urgently resist the idea that a second consecutive generation might be denied the American dream, no matter how shattered the economy. And the question is, if Bannon believes that he is working for this gray warrior, then he's missing a very important point. Millennials are the ones who lead the way forward out of a crisis story, but considering the needs of the young has never had any place under Trumpism. Trump's words appealed most to older generations who felt like something had been taken away from them, not to the younger generation, who felt like they were never given a chance in the American dream, of the American dream in the, in the first place. So, yeah, yeah, this fourth turning, are you there? Yes, the fourth know. turning is, so the fourth turning is the story of our country unifying against internal struggles and an outside threat. The authors describe it as the natural course of history, as something that just falls into place. Instead, what we are seeing with Trump's travel ban and his threats against Mexico and China is the creation of enemies, enemies many Americans don't want to have. 
And instead of uniting us, Bannon's belief in the fourth turning is dividing us. And this is dangerous on chartered territory. And uh, yes, what comes next is always unwritten. For sure. <laughs> yeah, but you know, um, I mean, let me be the fly in the ointment here. Um, you know, the fact is, is that we do have issues that are very serious, and they are global. Uh, we do have uh, extremists who are indeed causing deaths and destruction. Uh, we have a government, our government, who is causing deaths and destruction. We have a massive influx of drugs and uh, crime that is coming across the borders. None of this is a lie, um, and, and it is concerning to me, not to the point to where I want to wall off the U.S. and, and pretend that, that uh, nothing else exists outside our borders, but I'm also not going to put blinders on and say the things that they're saying are happening are not happening, you know. Uh, and these, these things were happening, they've been happening for the last 15 to 20 years. This is, these are things that we have been dealing with for quite some time. Now, I will be the first to say that I don't think if we, this country and other countries, would not have been in the Middle East exploiting their oil and causing this unrest uh, and, and blowing those people up, innocent people up, just so that they can have a foothold to be there. Um, that we wouldn't have these issues. But what I'm saying is the issues are real. We do actually have these issues. And uh, I think that uh, well, the author is going about yeah. it all wrong. And I think that Bannon, uh, what they're going to do is they're going to take us into another war. But I think we yeah. were going there anyway without them. Yeah. Well, the author of The Fourth Turning actually says that um, while this talking about the cycles and why he wrote this book, he's saying about Bannon that Bannon is enthralled, enthralled. Uh, I mean, enthralled by this, by this, uh, what he wrote. But he says that uh, in 2010 he released a documentary called Generation Zero that is structured around our theory that history in America and by extension most other modern societies unfolds in a reoccurring cycle of four generation long eras. Um, while this cycle does include a time of civic and political crisis, a fourth turning in our parlance, the reporting on the book has been absurdly apocalyptic. And that's the author speaking about how Banyan is, has taken what he's written. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just right. reading what yeah, but then you got to say why, people. you know, yeah, because, Pat, I mean, we do see, you know, uh, uh, these things, like you say, have been happening, um, and Trump isn't the only one. By the way, there was a huge, uh, in the 1930s, I don't know, thousands of Mexican people were were deported back to Mexico. I mean, that's part of our history, whoever knew that. Right. I mean, literally thousands just picked up. Or wherever, off the streets and whatever, were, you know, sent back, you know, in, to Mexico. Um, deportation. I just read something interesting, though, of course, you know, who, who is it, you know, like they say, follow the money? Who, uh, benefits from these, um, you know, these, these places, these deportation camps in the United States? Who benefits, you know, where they're keeping, uh, people before they deport them. You know, there's right. uh, women, families, private. women, men. It's private industry. Private. Like it's private. Thing. It's private industry. And boy, are they making a lot of money. And the ICE. The only way they make money is get people in there. you got to have people but in there to make the money. They have quotes that they have to fulfill. Yeah. Have yeah. quotes that they have. I mean, pretty thing when you see what they're doing with people's lives, you know. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. So, we are in a, a situation here to where uh, 
and remember we've talked about this before, they never engineer a scenario without making sure that you're squeezed in between a rock and a hard place to where the decisions that, and the choices that you will make will only re go toward one outcome or the other that they have devised. They're not going to let you, uh, you're only going to be able to go to A or B. Uh, you cannot, you cannot make your own C. You know, they're going to put you between a rock and a hard place so that the only choices that, that you have are the choices that they allow you to have. And this is what I'm seeing here. It's the same thing being played out. Um, this, I do find this book intriguing, but Barb, I mean, if, uh, even knowing this, it, we're still talking about an agenda being played out over and over and over, which is what we've always talked about, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's the, the, it's it's like learning, right? For learning, we just keep repeating. Yeah, we just yeah. keep repeating the behavior, and it's getting to levels of more absurdity, and you know, in my estimation, more violent, more absurd. Right. Exactly. So now, you and I were talking about something very, we were talking about so many things, very heavy things we were talking about today, folks, as Patty and I often do, and we were going at right into, This ties into what we were talking about here in an in a offhanded way. It's like uh, this first conversation is a segue into what we want to talk about, because it does have some yeah. And there's a few things that I've kind of like jotted down here with some other very interesting um, videos I was watching. Uh, I don't know how you feel about, um, let me just look for him again, uh, Richard, no, 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 wrong, wait, 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 um, Dr. Stephen Greer, okay? Um, I sent you that video because, yeah. Well, I, I like him, too. I think he, he's really amazingly fascinating to what's going on here. And this is what I why I sent that to you, because what he was talking about in this video, you and I were saying, why, okay, there's, a, there's something going on. We've been saying this for how long? There's something bigger going on, and it's a secret, and they're not, they don't want us to know, right? That, that was what we started our discussion with, right? And I think this... Dr. Yes. Stephen Greer, he's talking about Planet X, Nibiru, the update this month, the pole shift, alien disclosure, and so on. And when he started talking, I got all excited. I said, you know what? Here's some answers, I think. Why? Why they don't want us to know. Why they're distracting us so much. We've been talking about the distractions over and over and over, deliberate distractions. That's what they're doing. All this yes. stuff. And why are they, why do they want to distract us? And you and I both came to the conclusion that there's something they don't want us to know. They don't want us to be aware of. And we were saying, okay, what is it? Now you said, and I know this is true too. Everybody knows, as should know anyway, the preparations that the elite, the cabal, the controllers have been in for many years. They've got the seed vaults, they've got their underground bunkers, they've got their hidden cities, you know, whatever it is, they're in preparation. And we were saying, okay, well, what is it, you know? Um, that's the big question, and then why? Now, he, Dr. Stephen Greer, gave some very interesting information that I thought this might be it, because, again, I don't know, maybe last year I was saying, you know what, people... Everybody's focused on what's going on here on terra firma, but there's something else going on, and we are we don't want to ignore this the ET equation in all of this because there's something going on here. Now we know that the government has technology that was given to them uh, by certain ETs. Also, as they're taking down these ships, they're they're learning a lot. The technology is is a extraordinary, the jumps and leaps of technology that are coming through. Looking at all that, um, they want war. Now, he says that what they want is World War III will be an interplanetary war. Actually, he's just he just quoted when he said that World War III will be an interplanetary war, but it's going to be set up, and some of the 
I'm not can't remember who he said. You'll hear it in the um, in the video if you listen to it. But some very high ups sa actually said this. So um, the thing is, there's a big change happening. There's a new paradigm shift happening, and it is about. I always say it's about religion, about spirit, spirituality, and economics. And um, it's this change, this new paradigm, is going to be the biggest event in the history of of, the, of humankind and the earth. And we talked about you talked about first. You started talking about what's happening up there with the different planets, with the sun flares, how we are experiencing these types of things from what's going on up there. The Earth is responding. We talked about that. We know the poles have shifted. We know that. Um, and other things are going on. And um, this is going to be, I feel, this is about our cosmic awareness and universal peace, but in relation to, of course, a cosmic peace, because they want they want to control out there, too. They want to be the warriors out there. They want to rule out there. And they want to take us from this earth with how many thousands of years, hundreds of years of war and dominance. They want to move that out to the next phase. And that's where we have to be careful. What do you think? I, I'm not sure about Nibiru. Uh, I do know, and I've talked about this before, I do know that there is a tenth planet out there. Uh, I knew this in 2002 for the first time uh, because I had been working in the schools and uh, I was a custodian and it was my job to go in after the classes were done, clean up the rooms. And uh, in the science rooms, they got this Scholastic Science News magazine that they worked on uh, per week and uh, then... Uh, the new one would be given out the next month. Well, in, in the Scholastic News magazine that was in the trash, I was getting ready to empty it, and I looked down, and on the very cover of this magazine that month, it says, Meet Your New Neighbor, and it showed a, a giant brown dwarf star. And so I took the one of the copies home with me and read through it, and it talked about this tenth planet that had an orbit that... Uh, came into our solar system, I can't remember, I think they said every 26,000 years or something like that, and that it came into the orbits of Pluto and Neptune. Uh, it didn't come any further, but they surmised, uh, because it did have planets with it and moons, uh, I think they said something like seven, and said that uh, they thought that it in some way uh, caused a collision with one of uh, the moons of one of the other planets, and that's where the Oort cloud, uh, not the, I mean the Kuiper belt, or no, the Oort cloud came from, whatever it is, the, the big uh, asteroid uh, field that, that is out there. And they said this was the cause of that. Um, they said that that's when it came around, that the gravitational, it's a binary of our sun, by the way, uh, and said that the gravitational... Uh, pull uh, caused and wrecked havoc with all the planets and the sun itself and that there were many changes that happened. Pole flips, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, many of the outer planets uh, uh, were, were uh, really in bad shape. But anyway, um, they said that it was making its way back. Uh, they showed an orbit of it where it did come in uh, but then it did not circle the sun like, like people are talking about it's doing. It just came in and went back out. Um, now, you know, uh, we know that science is only going to give us half truth, so <clears throat> I don't know. But <clears throat> I think that if there was a brown dwarf the size that they are saying that this brown dwarf is its tenth planet, and that it was make if it was making its way into our solar system, it would definitely cause great changes. Uh, but yet, where is the where where where's the proof? Where are the uh, the corroborating uh, pictures that these satellites should have, these observatories should have, Hubble? And then again, we have all these infrared satellites that have been put up there in order to take 
infrared pictures, which of a brown dwarf, that's what you would want. So I'm on the fence still, but I know well, that they just going um, on there. They just uh, came out with, I don't know, last month or whatever, they just discovered, now I'm not positive, but the amount of maybe five new planets in our solar system. Wow, I didn't hear that. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, it was a big deal. They were all excited, of course. I don't know if I can I can find that. I'll see. But um, getting back to what Stephen Greer was saying about, he's been in contact with a lot of um, government officials. He was in France speaking about the, the French people are actually moving forward or, you know, to with contact with working with you know with from a different perspective and that here in the United States the people that he has spoken to which are military people as well as government people pretty much one of the responses was that this person knew all about this but he said I'm not going to help you I'm not going to say anything because we have to maintain the status quo of the global energy supply. And if this is known, if this comes out, this will change civilization. Everything about civilization will change. They have zero point free energy is available already, but they're keeping this a secret. So we're looking at the collapsing of the structure of, you know, the structure uh, that the agenda or the controllers have had in place. We're talking oil, gas will be obsolete, nuclear power will be obsolete, jet engines, religious beliefs, everything will go down the tubes. Um, basically, if this is known, if people do actually learn uh, what is happening here, that there is um, a contact, that there are certain governments that are working with these ETs, they do have many of the technologies already, even our government, and they're keeping this a secret. Well, uh, that wouldn't be unlike them. I mean, um, no. we know this is, this is fact, that, that they do indeed have technologies uh, that are far beyond what we use today, and, and actually none of the destructive methods that we are using today are necessary because they have all the knowledge and technology that can replace it all, but they have refused to allow it. And even those people who come up with uh, the ability to, to create their own free energy and such, uh, they're, they're snuffed, you know. Uh, their inventions are taken. They, they are, are disappeared um, or, or they are uh, completely ruined, bankrupt, uh, to keep them from implementing these, these things worldwide. I remember the guy in, oh, it might have been Australia, who came up with uh, a form of free energy, and uh, he showed the machine working and was getting ready to uh, bring it to the world, and he disappeared, and the machine disappeared. Uh, this is all, it's believable to me. I, it's not far-fetched to me. I do believe, however, that what is coming is going to be far more extreme than anything that we have ever experienced. Uh, we don't have the history. Uh, I think we were talking about this earlier today. We only have 2,000 years worth of history, uh, uh, lore, and prophecy to go by. What happened before that 2,000 years? Um, there, I know that Christians believe that, that the earth is 6,000 years old. Well, where's the, uh, or 2,000 years old, whatever. But uh, uh, archaeological uh, knowledge and stuff goes, goes much further back than that. Yet uh, we have no, we have nothing to go by. So anything that has been created for us in this last 2,000 years could have been implanted. Uh, we have we have the prophecies that all talk of the same thing of Armageddon of da 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 da. We have uh, uh, all of these people talking about you know we have the Hopi prophecy with the gourd of ashes and and all of these things. 
that speak of something uh, extraterrestrial, right, uh, coming yeah. toward the Earth. Uh, and I am of a mind that the reason why we're seeing these seed banks put up, the, the genetic seed banks or the genetic banks that have been put up where they have, they have supposedly cataloged every plant, every animal, uh, and, and the human genome, uh, all of this, and they're all in these fail-safe uh, 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 deep bunkers, uh, these banks. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. It seems to me that the people who understand and know that this cyclical event that has happened before is going to happen again, uh, and they know this, so they have made preparations. Uh, they know that when this happens, when when whatever is going to happen, that we cannot control, that we cannot stop, because it is beyond Earth's ability. This is a, a uh, something that is far beyond that. Uh, it could be uh, Nibiru. It could be. It could be something else. I don't know. But uh, we do know that they have made preparations, and are able, with what they have and the technology that they have, they're able to reseed and rebuild the earth. Uh, it wouldn't be a great stretch uh, stretch for them to do this. And uh, they're keeping us, I believe, and I've been saying this for a long time before I even started looking into this stuff. I've, I've been always saying Something's going on because they're putting this in our face, all of this strife, everything on that's going on on Earth, and they're throwing it in our face, and they're they're putting so much out there for us to be afraid of and concentrate on and focus on that we're not watching. They're hiding something. They're right. hiding something. We're not exactly. watching what's coming up behind us, and that's their way of ensuring that a billion people don't rise up and ruin their plans to to make it through this, you know? I simply think well, that's the deal. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. Like I've, We both have been saying this for a few years now. There's something else going on that, that uh, they're keeping hidden from us because, well, they're distracting us. You know, we've been saying over and over again, stop being distracted and start focusing and start really paying attention. Um, they're deliberately throwing distractions every which way you know, in our path. Um, so either it is a going to be a um, reoccurrence of what has normally happened, and I don't know if I like to use the word normally, but a reoccurrence of something that they know. It, either it's going to be an asteroid or a Nibiru, I don't know, or it's going to be like Dr. Stephen Greer is suggesting, that they want to be out there, you know, in the frontier, the new frontier in the cosmic system, and they know these ET exists, and they want to be the controllers of it, just like they are here on the Earth. So they're set up. They've been trying to actually, he's saying this, they've been trying to provoke a war, an outright attack from these ETs, um, because they're shooting them, you know, down with the new technology that they have that nobody knows that they have. And when they come through these 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 parallel um, levels, they immediately you know take them out with the attempt, like he's saying, of um, having you know provoking them. They want a world war, like just like we're saying that the the hawks here on this earth want a third world war. They want war. That's the the greed machine, the war machine. That's how they function. And uh, is there going to be a, like we've said, okay, we've, we, you and I have said, and I'm sure there's others, that something is going to happen. We know this is going to be something big. There is a new paradigm. There is a transition. There is a change afoot. It is happening on many, many levels. Yes, some of it is man-induced. Some of it is, you could say, just an, a cycle. Okay, then there are prophecies that speak about end times everywhere, everywhere. The Bible and the indigenous people and so on. Okay, we have the gut feeling <laughs> that something is going to come about. Is it going to be, you know, 
induced uh, deliberately by the elite, by the cabal, who are in preparation for, you know, for years now? Um, or, yes, are they privy somehow to this natural shift of events of the earth that, it, that they're going to need to be underground and need those food banks? Or are they going to provoke it? Are they going to create it so that they can be, you know, the top dogs um, as we move out into space, because we are moving out. We are. I mean, it's very obvious that that's going to be the next uh, transition for humanity. And, uh, you know, there are other beings out there. Um, so, you know, it's not uh, unknown. By some people, of course, it is, because it's sort of, how do you wrap your mind around that, folks, you know? Um, some of us have had personal experiences with those beings, with others, and the other, like indigenous people, are very well aware, throughout the world are very well aware, and have spoken about this, and have history. Um, you know, you could say there's the myths, but to me, there are no myths. This is sort of like the ancient ones left us information, uh, to, you know, to decipher and to discern, or perhaps to warn us. So we know that the elite cabal controllers, Luciferans, whatever you want to call them, ha are privy to certain knowledge. And they've had this knowledge, and they have done it out of us, because we all had the knowledge, we all had the wisdom. And But they have done a good job of dumbing us down to the most important, significant knowledge and wisdom. Part of that is about who we really, truly are, you know, they've done a good job of, um, distract, you know, detracting us about that and getting a, our minds and our lives all filled up with mundane stuff that appears to be important while they've been at work. Okay, so they know a lot. They, have, they are privy to a lot of things that um, the majority of people are not. They know something, something coming. They know. And we're just talking about, okay, what is that something? You know, there's a few things here that we've just discussed of possibilities. Um, I, I really don't know. I just know that there is something. We are heading for, you know, I want to say um, the paradigm, the transition in the paradigm on one level to me is that the spiritual um, shift, that spiritual paradigm. We call it the fifth world, thousand years of peace, which is, I'm going to say, I'm just going to throw this out, Patty. I'm going to say it's a state of mind. Um, I'm going to say it's a state of being, okay? Um, and again, it ha has to do with your own frequency. It has to do with what you are um, focusing on, what your intention is, what your beliefs are, what you are vibrating. Right? And that is a state of being. So the fifth world, thousand years of peace, is. does it mean we're going to be in uh, all wiped out and we're in a spiritual awareness, a consciousness in this, in this thousand years of peace? It is, the thousand years of peace are even spoken of in the Bible, by the way, but this is a indigenous prophecy, a Hopi prophecy about the thousand years of peace. Are we going to be here on the planet? But it will be completely different, changed, a transition into a parallel planet, a parallel realm. Will we be on another system, a cosmic system? We don't really know for sure. Is that up to us to manifest this? Because we are co-creators. So if you hold, if you hold a frequency of peace and love and compassion, you are manifesting. You are creating. Um, is that your thousand years of peace? You know, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just throwing all this out here because I've gotten all this information. But what I'm finding out is no one really knows the final, uh, answer or the, or the whole piece, the whole, the whole thing. You know, it's sort of like, does it mean that it is up to us? What, we shift into, in or transition into. I believe it does. Um, you know. Uh, so, what what do you think? What do you think there on that? Well, I think that uh, when we look at the state of 
our reality today on this earth, uh, there is nothing that we control. Um, everything is, is being dumped on us. And the only thing we're doing is trying our best to, to live within uh, this chaos that, that they have been throwing at us constantly. And if you look at the last decade, uh, they have started throwing everything, including the kitchen sink at us, as if uh, there is a, a buildup and, and a urgency to make sure that we are all running around chasing our tails and, and fearing uh, what's in front of our face. Um, the spiritual aspect of self is under attack because of this. Uh, the connection, the frequency, we talked about this, and we've talked about it many, many times, that this frequency uh, that we all share, we are all connected through this energy of creation. It is measurable. Even the plants and the animals exhibit this energy of life. Um, so we know that there is another aspect of ourselves uh, we talked yesterday, I think it was, or the day before yesterday, uh, no, we talked on Gerald's show about uh, the fact that we have our feet in both worlds. We have, our, we have our physical reality and then we have our spiritual reality. The problem being is, is that we have given over ourselves so much to this physicality and the issues that we're facing here that we are stepping away from that spiritual connection. Uh, I think this is on purpose. I think that uh, as far as a thousand years of peace and the prophecies that are being uh, uh, given out, uh, that have been given out, you know me, I am one of the biggest skeptics of all time because when things look too pat, I'm always saying, hey, let's look at this. Well, it's possible to me, Barb, that... These uh, prophecies were implanted uh, in, a, in a, very, a very, very, very long time ago. Um, and that these prophecies are being played out because they know the game plan. They know what's going to happen. When, when they say a thousand years of peace, if, if we are looking at, and if we look at the universe, if we look at the solar system, we see that the changes that are happening on Earth are also being played out on every other planet and even on the sun. Changes that are extreme, uh, and I won't go into them because it, it takes too much time, but anyone who has done any research on what's happening in our solar system alone has to say there are weird Things happen and things are changing. Uh, and so we know, I know, that looking at this, there is an aspect that is beyond the machinations of these controllers on this earth. That everything that they are doing right now is to keep us from understanding what is coming. This new age, this fifth world, uh, it may not exist in reality. It may exist on a totally different plane. And I am more inclined yeah. to think that our spiritual uh, connection, that frequency, uh, and, and our devotion, our commitment to that is, is what we need to be concentrating on, you know? Exactly. No, I totally agree with you. That's what I'm saying. It's sort of like uh, I believe it's up to us where we will create or manifest that world thousand years of peace you know um so and again it's up, i feel it's ultimately up to us it's up to humanity um and yes being uh pummeled with so much that we can't even have a, a frequency of love or compassion and that's part of their agenda so you know the controllers don't want us to have a high frequency they don't they don't want that light to shine they don't want that shift into that higher frequency because that disrupts their plan um you know i think that's part of it um i know that uh the way that elders receive prophecy and these prophecies are quite ancient are through spirit through communication and ceremony that i do know 
Um, and I know that these uh, elders that receive these particular prophecies are, you know, very adept at communication with the higher realms, with great spirit, with, you know, with their, um, the ancestors or, you know, that, that type of thing. So as far as is it real or true or manifested, I don't know. I just know that um, I'm only speaking, you know, about the uh, elders, the indigenous people who are, you know, adept at working with the ancestral spirits and what they receive and so on. That's all that I know. But, you know, certainly there's a lot of imprints. I'm not saying it's not true. You know, there are imprints, there are brainwashings, there are mind control, there are lots of things. And, you know, just like the fear, the fear mongering about ETs are going to overtake the world and capture us and make us slaves and so on and so forth, you know. Um, and yet you have also the... Um, captured in slaves. Exactly, but you, but you have, this is a big fear thing, alien, oh my God, you know, coming from another place and they're going to take us away or enslave us or whatever. Um, but you also have the, um, you know, the allies, the, the allies or the Wichopioyate, star relatives that also, you know, are present. Um, you know, I'm saying there's two sides to a situation. Yeah, you brought you know? up just a little bit, but we could hear you. Yeah, it came okay. out. It was just a little muddled. Uh, Zeke says, you can't have a thousand years of peace when governments still control the military-industrial complex. And, uh, yeah, you have a point there. But mm. if, if what... Not on Earth. <laughs> right, right. But what I'm seeing uh, is that they have made these extensive preparations to uh, ensure that all life on Earth is cataloged and stored somewhere in a vault. Uh, they have made extensive uh, dumps, deep underground military bunkers for uh, uh, the continuance of governments and stuff. They know something's coming, and it's not a world war that they're worried about. They know something else is coming. They're pushing. You see, whenever I, whenever I'm looking at stuff, I look at the things that they're not talking about things that they will not mention, the things that they will not corroborate, the things that they will not boo-hoo even, because they don't want you talking about it at all, right? So what are the things that they are not talking about? They're not talking about what's going on in our solar system. They're not talking about the big changes that are coming. They're not talking about the possibility of this tenth planet coming in here. They're not touching on any of that. Even NASA, uh, with their little uh, uh, blurbs here and there, are not uh, giving you information on this. Yet, we have these amateur astronomers and other scientists, PhDs, uh, astrophysicists, who have actually come out and said, we are witnessing severe catastrophic changes to our solar system, to the planets, to the sun. We have radiation levels that are coming from the sun that shouldn't be coming, they say, because there are no sunspots. Yet, here we are dealing with gamma radiation and other radiation coming in waves uh, so much that they've caused a wave on Venus that goes from one pole to the other. Uh, and Venus has no atmosphere, so it has no buffer against gamma radiation, against solar winds, against any of these things. And, and Sa uh, Venus, excuse me, is exhibiting massive disruption and this massive wave that have, has been uh, uh, photographed uh, and as it moves along. So, go ahead. Right. Well, here's, I just popped this information into the chat and to you also. Uh, what do they know? Oh, the mega rich are preparing for disaster. So, um, the British Daily Mirror reports an American company is creating 1.5 million earthship shelters designed to survive radiation, outbreaks, or a killer virus. 
there are in all over the world this is happening. About 50 miles northwest of Dallas, there's a survivalist luxury community is being planned. Um, they have uh, widespread media reports as well as independent investigators from groups such as New World Wealth suggest wealthy people around the globe are quietly moving away from major cities because of some social instability uh, in, of course, you know, terrorism, increasing crime, and so on. They're, uh, but if something is afoot, <laughs> as if, you know, they're talking about these, you know, hideaways, like, like you're saying, you know, uh, these people, it's all the wealthy. People, that's that's happening. Safe drinking water, nutritious food, essential equipment to protect you and your family, um, an economic classes of people using common sense. Uh, are the and the resources at hand can take reasonable and effective measures to provide some acceptable level of self protection. I think that the rich and elite are becoming increasingly aware of the dangerous and potentially unstable world in which we now reside. Massive instances of civil unrest, even in America, are becoming a very real possibility. Internal terror attacks, swelling illegal alien populations, an influx of Islamic refugees. They go on and on with with all of this, um, but I don't think they're on it yet. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? And, and, I think. You know, yeah, and here again we have them talking about how they're building these, these shelters and, and the rich are preparing to go underground because of nuclear war or because of viruses and things like this, still nothing being said about what's happening uh, to our solar system, uh, you know? And I want to apologize to everybody out there. We have some really severe wind and such coming through right now, and it's really messing with my connection here. I have a, uh, a podunk uh, internet service provider, and uh, so sorry about any garbling or, or, or noise distortion that you might hear. Uh, can't help it. Can't do anything about it. Skype won't play nice. But, um, yeah, uh, the thing of it is, is that I don't think that they would be building these underground bunkers if they were afraid of war. Uh, nuclear war, if they were afraid of a virus, I mean, in mass, the way they are. This is a concerted effort among the elite, uh, all of them, right? And um, Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm of a mind uh, that the issues that we're facing right now are subterfuge. Uh, the issues that we are facing right now are to keep us from paying attention because if 8 billion people on this planet were to figure out the truth of what's happening, uh, their plans would go strictly downhill. As long as we think, you know, we're thinking, oh, they're afraid of nuclear war, we don't have, no bombs are falling, so it ain't no big thing, you know, don't worry about it. But if we knew that our planet was going to be shaken, that the, the uh, that there were going to be earth changes way beyond our conception and that life would definitely change uh, drastically, uh, then maybe we would, we would rise up and we would say, hey, you got to do something to help us. You know, uh, why are there other countries that uh, are building underground uh, areas for the, for the whole populace that they have? Like Germany. Yeah. Uh, why yeah. is this happening and yet nothing being said, you know, here? Um, all of these things. you got to look at this. And, and no matter what you feel the outcome is, of this is, if you don't believe that, that anything's happening in our solar system, even with all the evidence, I know a lot of people say, well, you can't know because we live on a flat earth and they're just lying to us. You know, all of this stuff. Actually, actually Russia, not Germany, Russia... Civil defense drill involving 40 million citizens as, as evidence that the global need are preparing for a worldwide catastrophe. So yeah. did Russia just have a drill for 40 million people? And they have a massive underground facility. Um, but there is another, there are an, others here that 
Vivos Europa, it's called, uh, is only the rich. So, a shelter only the rich. Um, and, and if we're looking at nuclear war, I mean, are they going to spend 500 years in the bunker? You know? Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, I... Do they have greenhouses down there and, and you know, the setups, uh, the technology for growing, you know, growing foods and, and so on and so forth, you know, I mean, if they're going to do this for that type of yeah. the dumb period thing, of time. The deep underground bunkers, they have entire cities. Yeah, they have the whole thing. Yeah. So, of course, in this uh, article, you know, they're, they're, the Nibiru comes into the equation here, you know, that belief there. You have all these different things, nuclear war. Third World War, nuclear war, then you have the Nibiru, or then you have the ETs, uh, whatever, or the asteroid, planet X, that's Nibiru coming. There's all these conjectures, but something is going to happen. Something, yeah, I, yeah. Well, first of all, let's look, at it. let's look at the fact that what's happening to the Mother Earth herself. How long can we really... How long can can we be supported here healthily, which it's getting, it's not so healthy anymore. 50, 60 years from this stage, how bad things are as far as the GMOs and the polluting of the waters, the oceans, the air, the chemistry. I mean, how long do you think hum humanity is going to last here? Well, you know. With just, that's, that's with just this. Yeah, and, and. That's what makes me think there's something else also. Uh, if you know that the earth is going to be devastated, that the face of the earth will be changed, uh, you're not worried about what you're doing to it. You're really not. People ask all the time, why are they doing this when they're living on the earth also? Well, possibly it's because they know that in the end none of this is going to make any difference because they're going to have to reform, uh, reseed, Anyway, so it, they'll it, just go to another sense. place. Well, or even I here, think they're with planning the that. banks and all of this and the DNA banks that they have, uh, they have the ability, the technology to to replant the earth, uh, including humans and every other but, animal but, and insect. But you can't replant the earth that it is destroyed. The the earth, the dirt itself, the earth itself. You can't. Clean the waters, the oceans. You can't. Well, yeah. You can't. Yeah, you can. You can because it's been done before. If if we if we want to believe that this is a cyclical thing, then we have to know that this has happened on the earth. Before. Has it been at this level? That's my always been a question. You know, the technology. See, that's a thing. We really don't know for sure. But a, we you, yeah. You, you had we a talk about extinction, that. A yeah. worldwide extinction with the dinosaurs, right? Uh, None of the none of the yeah. plants, the living things, made it through there. Um, yet uh, uh, here we are. You know, um, maybe what caused that extinction is what's going to cause this extinction. You know, mass extinction. I don't know. Right. I don't know. But I do know that if I was in control and I was looking at things that were going to happen that I could not control then it wouldn't make any difference to me to ravage the earth and have the people uh, give them something to put all their energy and focus on so that I didn't have to worry about 8 billion people beating down my door saying, you better let me in because I see what's coming, you know, just saying. That's my, my line of thought, weird as it is, warped as it is, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, all we can really do is, you know, just like uh, is to research and explore and, uh, you know, work to uncover the hidden things, you know. Uh, like I said, putting the pieces to this big puzzle together, you know, it is a, a, it's a complex big puzzle and we're not getting a lot of factual information, but we can at times read behind the, the false information or, you know, put put things together, you know, um, but ultimately, Patty, I just feel like we're, we're really, we won't really know, 
we just have feelings. We have a sense of something, you know, and we see all this stuff going on. One thing I know is that they're working diligently, and they have been, to keep everybody terrified and dumbed down and and basically blocked. That's a key piece. Regardless of what is going to come, we better get ourselves awake. We better wake up. We better figure things out for ourselves and our families. And you know me, I'm always saying get right with your creator because that's going to be your foundation that will get you through whatever they throw at us, whatever is thrown at us, whatever comes, that piece to me is a key piece. If it is the end, let's say it's going to be the end. And all of humanity, either we're going to wipe ourselves out or something's going to wipe us out or whatever is going to happen. If you don't have that foundation that you can rely upon, it's going to be, I'd say, just more difficult. Way more difficult, I'm just saying. Yep. That's yep. my perspective. Well, why don't we take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about if there are solutions, what could be our solutions. Okay, do Sound like a winner? Yeah. Okay. You are listening to Turtle Talk on These Changing Times Radio, and uh, we're having oh, a, a discussion on possibilities, I guess you could say, um, of what's behind the... the uh, uh, current uh, mode of, of terror and fear that is being planted in, in our lives on a daily basis. So uh, we'll listen to a couple of songs, and when we come back, we'll talk about what we can do, uh, each of us, individually, collectively, uh, to maybe uh, get through this, if there's a way of getting through it anyway. Okay, and welcome back to Turtle Talk on These Changing Times Radio. And I picked those two songs to go ahead and play because um, they kind of fit, you know, what what I want, where we want to go right now. Um, the first one, of course, uh, uh, was uh, Marvin Gaye and uh, What's Going On, and the other one was Joan Osborne and One of Us. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's many things that we could tell you. Go ahead and prep. Get your stuff together. Get get boxes of goods and, and make sure that you know where your water is and, and uh, get yourself a good place out of the way. And, and But um, I think there's something more important that we need to prepare, uh, and that's our spiritual self the aspect of of spirit and our connection uh, with the frequency of of, uh, creation. Um, I think this is maybe where, and of course, uh, if we we look at uh, most indigenous prophecies, they speak of this very thing, of getting yourself right, of, of making that connection, of seeing yourself, in the, the light of creation instead of the light of man. And perhaps this is the key uh, to where we need to be, Barb. Well, you know, I've always said that. That's always my final, um, my final um, point. It's just been very strong, you know, uh, with with me for the last couple of years and you know I said over and over again yeah like you started we could tell you to get your water or your canned goods you know whatever we could tell you to do all that that I guess that's important it is to some degree but to me not as important as um as our relationship to creator you know and yeah that song what if God you know, what if God were one of us? And it's like, yeah, where is God in this equation? Because this is really important. You know, create a great spirit. Wakantanka is as, as a, in the Lakota way, meaning creator or God. Wakantanka is, uh, does represent the creator, the great mystery. And, um, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like when I say this, to the listeners, or I throw this out into the world when we're talking, and I say, the most significant piece 
the most essential and important piece, in my estimation, is get right with your creator. Get right with your God. Make your relationship. You know, um, know you, who you are as a sacred child, one that was created from a source out of love and joy. Because that's how I look at creation. I look at creation as a miracle, every part of creation. I look at creation as created with awe and love and joy. And so, you know, I just look outside, you know, when you go out, out into nature for me. And I always advise people, if you really feel down, if you feel depressed, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel alone, if you feel disconnected, if you don't know what the heck is going on, just go out into, onto the mother. Go out. Find your place. Even if it's just a little place, go find it. You, it will change your experience. It will renew you. It will heal you. You will have a shift. It will happen. Um, it's up to you how you want to go out there, but it does happen. And um, I look at uh, this whole piece here as we are very well aware of the state of affairs, uh, what is going on. And yes, it is deeply troubling. And yes, at times I just weep because... You know, the innocents uh, that are being taken and destroyed and violated, everything to me is in nature. The creatures are innocent. Our children the, are innocent. You know, that's how I look at it. To me, I, I sometimes just cry because it just, it's sad. It's just sad. And I was thinking of creator, you know, and times I just have a conversation, you know, with great spirit and I was just, really feeling the sorrow uh, that I was experiencing, the sorrow of the beauty here on the mother just being desecrated. I was watching this documentary on Appalachia, the mountains, the clear cutting, the coal mining. Now they just don't dig holes anymore and send men down in. What they do is they just clear mountaintops off, just shear the mountaintops, shear the mountains off. Such destruction, you know, and that's just one part of the Mother Earth that's that's happening too, and it just it's heartbreaking. And uh, I see these things, and it touches me very deeply. It saddens me very deeply. Um, yes, I'm. I feel the people, the human beings suffer too, but my heart is my heart is most sad for those who are innocent. Um, you know, as I said, the creatures, even the trees, the standing people, the winged ones, the ones that creep along the ground, you know, live in the Mother Earth, or the tiny ones, you know, the creeper crawlers, we call them, and the water people, you know, the brooks, the the little creeks, the rivers, everything. That breaks my heart. And I was in conversation with great spirit the other night and I was just saying you know I, I'm feeling such sorrow here for your creation my heart is breaking you know and I was saying I wonder if you feel that sorrow great spirit you know I of course don't know uh, I don't know if that's possible but to me I feel the creation was manifested and dreamed and was a beautiful sacred vision um, for all that we see here, if you look without all the mess we've made, it is a paradise, you know, or was a paradise. Some of it still remains that way, but how long will it remain that way? And so I say, you know, um, the stress that I have, um, the endurance that I'm given uh, is all because of my spiritual connection. My ceremonies, the sacred uh, Chanumpa Wakan, the sacred pipe I carry, the ceremonies, the prayers, you know, that's my foundation. And I do know things are troubling, and I do know things are on levels that are pretty stunning. But I have that, that, that connection, my creator, right, my relationship. And that's what, no matter what happens, I guess I'm saying, this is if you don't have that what are you going to hang on to what what is going to get you through right 
Yeah, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right, Barb, with, with sometimes it is so overwhelming uh, when you see the suffering of innocence, and, and I do mean innocence uh, in, in the uh, reality of that word, uh, those who have no control uh, and have no insight into the destruction that is being wrought upon them, no understanding, uh, but also on the same, in the same thought, I know that the earth and life is dynamic and that the mother herself has uh, wiped out entire species, has wiped out entire civilizations, uh, that this has happened. Uh, but it's always been in balance. Uh, in other words, uh, a, a whole ecosystem may be destroyed, but another one will grow up in its place. What we are seeing is quite different. What we are seeing is the direct destruction of life, period. Uh, and it's very hard, it's very hard to, to be able to see this happening and not be able to change it, not be able to stop it. And I can't tell you either, Barb, how many times I have in prayer broke down in tears and wept for the, the little, uh, the littlest of, of life, the, the, the meekest of life, the, even down to, to the, the, the microbes and stuff that have been destroyed because I feel that all life is sacred to a point to where, to the nth degree, uh, I am empathic in that point to where uh, I am well aware of life in all its aspects, every Every species, every life form, uh, to me is precious and sacred and is, is just as viable, just as valuable, just as worthy of life as, as every other life. And it, it breaks my heart. And I have, uh, on many occasions, and especially with the young, uh, cried out and, and begged, you know, Please uh, sustain them. Please bring them peace. Please, please bring them love. And I always get the answer back that they are loved, they are sustained, and they are continuing. Uh, that is my strength in this. That's why I can continually pull myself back up instead of dropping down into this abyss of despair. Because if I were to concentrate on what's happening out there and would not have the conviction uh, and the faith to know that all things exist all ways, I would lose myself. I would lose the will to be. Uh, I couldn't handle it. That I should be here and live and breathe while others who were so innocent are devoid of that, are, are uh, denied that because of human hands, uh, because of human control, uh, human destruction. Um, and it's my spiritual aspect of self that keeps me from falling through that void. Uh, and it always has. The pain is there. It will never go away. I will never stop feeling the pain of every living thing that is suffering. Uh, I cannot. I wouldn't want to, because if I ever did, then I would lose the greatest part of myself, which would be that connection with all life. And it is that connection that sustains me. Uh, and that connection is real. That frequency that I talk about the energy of crea creation, uh, it is real. It is tangible to me. I experience it on a, a uh, level beyond this physical realm. It is more real to me than the physical aspect of self because there is not a time when I have not reached for that connection and found it, uh, not found it. 
However, there are many times when I have tried to connect with the physical and I can't do it um, because there's no understanding there. There's no reality uh, that, that exists within, within parallel with me, um, if that makes any sense. So to me, strength of spirit is the optimum. It is what gets us through. It is what takes us to the next day. It is what gets us through the next day. It's what causes miracles. That yep. faith, that conviction, that, that connection is what uh, strengthens us in the times that we need it most. It is what protects us from ourselves many times. Um, it is it is what we are, the truth of who we are and where we come from. And nothing can interfere with that unless we allow it to. If we can strengthen our spiritual connection, when we look at the world as it is, in the suffering that it is, and we give in to that suffering, and we become depressed, and we fall into this, uh, uh, this, this depression that is so deep uh, that we forget that connection, then a part of us does die, and, and yeah, the, yeah. the most instrumental part of us does. Um, exactly. I totally agree with you. Yeah. This time we're in right now, this is the test of that connection, I do I believe, believe, Barb. Yeah, I believe it, too. Yeah. No, I believe that, too. And, um, you know, I have seen so many miracles in my life, and uh, I know more miracles are happening every day in other parts of people's lives, you know, and um, I guess, you know, perhaps if you don't feel like miracles are happening and things are really uh, pressuring you and, you know, really overwhelming and so on, you know, that's why I say it's sort of the way, I mean, I've gone through periods like that and the only thing that brings me up and pulls me out is my connection to a great spirit, you know, and I have to say that years ago in my 30s I had a near-death experience and I've talked about this before but this to me is a very significant um, piece because in that time I was a young mother and uh, I had a near-death experience and I had two sons, um, you know, small sons and things were fine, you know, and I had this near-death experience where I was taken into the light as it is described I didn't know, of course, after when it ha after what happened. I didn't know I had a near death experience, but I did say to myself, I just was with God, and I didn't talk about it for a long time. Okay. I didn't know really, did not talk about it. But then later on, I found a book, uh, Life After Life After Life. It was about the, Dr. Raymond Moody's um, interviews with numerous, numerous people who had near death experiences, and they talked pretty much identically to my experience and the you know it's a pretty profound um, moment and it's like a split second but it seems like endless but you are engulfed and I was engulfed in this brilliance this brilliance of light uh, it was not my physical body it was my conscious self and I was embraced with such um, uh, you know, a love that we do not experience as human beings. We experience love. Yes, we do. But this love is different. The joy that I felt was different, profound, um, and indescribable. Um, the What was absent was fear, anxiety, guilt, depression. Sorrow, all things that we experience here as a human on earth was completely absent. The only experience was one of, I just say divine love, because how could you even describe divine love? You cannot, but I'm just trying to tell you it's nothing like the love that we experience here as humans. And when I was informed that I had to return, I felt this tremendous fear and resistance. I did not want to return. I think it was because, you know, I knew what was coming. You know, I'm 74. This was, I was in my 30s. And I was 
rapidly moving back into the area where I was, into my body, and I heard these words. And the words were, no matter what, everything will be all right. And from I went into my body. Now, I know those words were from Creator, Great Spirit. I wasn't talking to myself in my head. I was in terror of going back to this body and back here. Um, and that that's so true, Barb. I just want to interrupt for a minute that that uh, that what you heard that everything will be all right uh, in in yeah the, in that aspect of, of spirit it always will be. That's exactly it. See, that's what we have to understand, and that is what I've come to realize, Patty. That where where I was was I was back home. I was in my I was in my soul spirit, I guess you'd say that, that awareness or that consciousness of my source, which was the light. And I was in that. And yes, in this experience here on earth, um, we do experience all these earthbound things, you know, like sorrow, like guilt, like fear, like hate, like judge. We do experience these things. And I think that's why I say we're here for, you know, school. We're here in a school to learn, maybe to become a better human being, maybe to find that spirit within ourselves and find our source again, to know that is real, to know this is really real and that this is where we will return to because, yes, no matter what, everything will be all right. And then you have to listen to those words, take them apart, no matter what. Everything will be all right. And that, to me, yeah? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, that's another thing that, that I've always known and always felt uh, why I don't. And I never have had a fear of, of death because I've never feared what comes next. I've always known that I return to source uh, the truth of, of who and where I come from. And that in itself uh, has always uh, uh, strengthened me in knowing that this is just temporary. And it no is. matter what we're going through, it, it has no bearing on where we're going to be uh, at the end of it. You know? Yeah, so they can do anything they want. They can throw whatever they want at us. They could create a cause or dismantle everything that we love and hold dear. Just the mere fact that we do love and we can weep for the innocent is a beautiful gift, you know, because the elders always say that your tears are prayers, you know. Yes, yes, So it is. getting, so knowing, knowing yourself, you see, this is the piece. Knowing yourself as a sacred being, spirit, soul, embodied within this physical experience that you are on a life's journey here. What can you learn from it? How can you grow from it? What are the choices that you are going to make? You know, knowing all of this as a great opportunity, I feel, you know, an amazing opportunity because things are in a circumstances that we perhaps have not experienced before, but I think this is a t time of telling, and that to me, I feel like this is a transition. Um, like I was reading about, you know, in the Bible, and some words about the Bible, and I don't know which, what it is, you know, from what part, it doesn't matter, because I'm not a Bible reader, but I've been looking more and more at the words and, and different teachings and insights and prophecies and how they do relate to a lot of other prophecies spoken about um, the grace, the, the pure grace. And it was, I guess it was described the way that Jesus gave his life on the cross or gave his life for our sins, the sins of humanity. And that gave us a period of grace. And now it was said or spoken of that the period of grace may be ending. So what does that mean? You know, what is a period of grace in, in this experience as a human being and the choices, our free will, the choices that we are making, what we choose, how we choose to live, or are we choosing compassion and love and, you know, 
assistance and help and being in service, or are we choosing another direction? And and how does this period of grace, uh, what does this mean at this time when we see the destruction of so, so much that we love and uh, rely upon happening? So what does that mean? Yeah, and it even goes deeper than that because that grace is, is part of self. And uh, how do you feel about self in this time? Uh, are you are you living in fear? Are you living in anger? You, uh, your perspective on life, is it one uh, to where you see only the darkness or are you looking at uh, the the perfection of life and, and the beauty that still exists within each and, and, and every one. Uh, it's, it's like hypothetically say that we knew that we were given word that said in three months time life will cease to be. How would you spend that three months? Would it be, yeah. would it be profitable for you to experience the physical aspect of the fear and the anger and the chaos, uh, or would it be more profitable for you to simply enjoy life, in, to simply reconnect with with love, with with uh, compassion, with these things that bring joy in life? Would you waste those three months of your life? Well, yeah. I mean, it, that's yeah. what many, many sages and many wise people say, you know, live life like it was your last moment, you know, because exactly. it could be, yeah, it could be, and I feel the same way. If you, if you are in fear, if you have doubt, then you are not connected to Creator, right? And and yes, and maybe it's time to make that change. Maybe it's time to see yourself in the eyes of creation as as part of creation and if, as being part of that, being beautiful, being perfect, being uh, of love and of joy. Uh, the things that we experience here on earth and the physical are far removed from where we originally come from. And if we give in to the anguish, to the pain, if we throw our hands up and say, okay, that's it, I'm just going to lay down and let the world just roll over me and there's nothing I can do and I'll just be sitting here worried, waiting, chewing my nails until everything falls apart. Uh, I mean, that's a miserable way to live. It's a miserable way to spend your life. Uh, what testament are you taking with you uh, to to the next? And uh, you know, it's 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 something that we all have to deal with. Uh, fear is a real thing. Fear is is real. It is tangible. Uh, we can't deny that it's that it's there. We can't just say, "Well, I won't fear," uh, because that's not going to work. Uh, I don't care who you are. Sooner or later, a spider's going to jump on you or something's going to happen, and you're going to fear. Uh, we do that. We're, we're in a physical self. I'm not saying that just deny everything's happening and don't fear. What I'm saying is understand that these things are happening, that there's nothing you can do except for live your life as well and as... Uh, loving and as caring for yourself and others as possible. That's the greatest thing that you can do uh, in any time, be it, be it uh, uh, a bountiful time or be it a disastrous time. You know, this is the aspect of self that lives on. This is the aspect of self that is beyond the control of this physical world to, to touch. And it's a sacred place. It's a sacred place that we all have, and it's it's our it's it's our um, oh it's our security in self. You know, uh, it's not the right word I want, but 
I would rather live my life in joy and in love, uh, seeing what's going on, understanding what's going on, uh, and, and giving in to recognizing that there are these harmful things, that there is pain, that there is anger, feeling it, but then understanding that these things will pass, that there is something greater beyond this, and that that's the direction we're going. We're going to the greater self. We're on our way to greater self. Uh, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, you know, having that experience, that near-death experience, um, of course, you can't recreate it. Uh, you know, you can't, you could attempt it. I've come, I've come to the periphery of that experience in a, in a visualization meditation. But I cannot go through that veil to that light because it's not my time yet. But I have sat in quiet meditation and going inward and projecting myself, um, toward that experience or toward that light. Yeah, but it's... We've always been walking toward that light. We've always, been, from the time we drew our first breath on this earth, we've been on a journey to get to, uh, back to the source. Exactly. But as far as I'm saying that I have actually, you know, because of, I want to go there. <laughs> I want to go back home is what I'm saying. Right. And in those moments, I can... I can put myself very close, okay, very close, and get a tiny, tiny semblance of what it was. Um, but I know that it's, you know, that I will go back there again, because that's where we came from. That is our sort. And like you say, we are, you know, from the time we begin here, we are on the way, on the pathway back to the source, on this great Say you're on in the medicine wheel of life. We only will head back, you know. And, you know, the thing is, and I've said this before, you know, that in the way of our people, um, there is this teaching that, um, and this is not just the First Nations teaching. It comes in a little bit different wording, but in the experience of people who have numerous thousands and thousands from all over the world, who have had near-death experiences that they have met either the ones, their loved ones, they have met God, they have met angels, or, there, or someone or some a being who said to them, um, who showed them the review of their life. It's like a split second of their whole life. And it's not for punishment. It's not for guilt. It's not for shame. It is just an awareness, okay, because those people who are having this near-death experience, of course, are meant to return. And it is an opportunity. And many of them have said, what I saw, the way I behaved, or what I missed, or what I overlooked, or how I affected someone. And now I'm here back on the earth again, and I can change my life now. I can do better. I can, you know, I can work towards... Um, you know, either, you know, a forgiveness or going to a person or whatever it is, they learn something. It's a powerful teaching. And uh, in the way of the First Nations people, the when you cross over, when you go through that veil, waiting for you are the ancient ones, the grandmothers and the grandfathers. And, you know, they pretty much say to you, we gave you a job to do on the earth. Grandson, granddaughter, how did you do? You know, they want to know because they did give us a job here. We made an agreement. We made an, uh, what I call, you know, our original agreement to come here to to do something, to fulfill something, to participate in some way. And, of course, it's, in my estimation, it is to better ourselves or to be kind and compassionate, to learn, to love, really love, you know to allow that unconditional love of our creator to come through us, to be that vessel, be that hollow bone, um, and uh, be the beacon for that love, that unconditional love and joy and light. You know, that I feel is an agreement that we all made. That's my estimation. And when the an ancestors ask us, hey... <laughs> 
how did you do? We gave you a job to do, you know. Uh, well, what are you going to say? How are you going to respond? What will your answer be, you know? And again, it's not for punishment, and it's not for shame, and it's not to be written through with guilt. That does not come into the equation, because it's a teaching. It's an opportunity, you know. Uh, if you're going to, I suppose, if you're going to say, uh, well, you know, we're going to come back around, reincarnation. I feel that this is a timeline. Pay attention. This is a timeline that we have come to, that there is no more grace, meaning there is no more reincarnation to get it right. That's what I feel it is. What do you think? I agree. I agree, and, and uh, I've had uh, the ancestors have spoken to me of this, and I've had visions of this, that this is the, the time of the choosing that now, in this time, uh, the test is on uh, for self, and, and you will be known by your choices in this time, and the choices that you make will be final in this time. Uh, I've seen this, and I've heard this. Um, I even, I've spoken of the vision that I've been given on this, um, and, and I agree 100%. Uh, there is no grace. What we do in this time is what we take with us. Um, I don't believe in That's absolution right. because I don't believe in in the uh, aspect of, of sin as in religious. Uh, no, I don't either. But I do believe that we are accountable for what we allow and what we create within this walk. Uh, and our choices will determine the truth of who we are beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know? Yep. I do agree. So We're almost out of time. we got six minutes, so uh, if we can finish it up. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I just think that our conversation w went uh, from some... Yeah, a lot of questions, but also some good points made, some solutions, and um, and as I, I just want to reiterate, you know, I think the top-notch key solution, as I said, always say, is, you know, our spiritual selves and our connection to our Creator. Um, get right with that, get strong with that. Uh, make that your foundation and it will bring you through whatever is coming regardless of whether it's natural, man-made it does not matter what matters is your connectedness to your creator and your foundation and that faith I couldn't have said it better Barb I couldn't have said it better uh, this is where we're at right now and um I don't think that you have to look far to find the relevance in what we're talking about. Uh, do what you can in the physical. If it's what you feel you need to do, go ahead and store that food, store that water, prepare yourself for, for the eventuality uh, of the changes that are coming upon us. But make that secondary to the preparation yeah. that you do for something. You know, also, you know, hey... Uh, Bring some joy into your life, joy and sing and dance, and you know, be with your family in a happy, joyous way. You know, change some old patterns, uh, and you know, right now is a good time to do that. You know, if you're just stuck in a rut, go out. You know, go out and turn the corner the other way. Take your children with you. Go out to the forest, or go to the park, or sit down in a circle and talk, or sing. You know, um, just bring joy into your life, and and make sure every day you have some gratitude for for life and the beauty all around. Yes, because it would be very, you know, disappointing to uh, walk this whole path and not do it in joy and love, you know. Uh, That's even, right. Even regardless of what's going on out there, you are the creator of the love and the joy, and everything that you create 
is a frequency, and that frequency travels on. So the more joy and love you bring into your life, the more joy and love goes into the lives of those you love, and so on, and so on, and so on. And isn't that much better than fear and anger, you know? Uh Uh-huh, I say. Well, I thank you guys for listening today, and I know that that lately we've been getting into some topics that are really kind of um, out there in a way, but um, nothing's out there anymore. I'm sorry. We're we're in a a, uh, place now that uh, anything and everything is a possibility. So we're going to be continuing to touch on subjects that uh, are not really with the current flow uh, considered, quote, normal, uh, but we do believe that these things need to be talked about, and uh, so stick with us. Uh, you've been listening to Turtle Talk on These Changing Times Radio. I want to thank the listeners for, t- for tuning in, and um, we'll see you next week, same time, same place, and uh, stick, stick around because we're going to have Barry on Wednesday night. Oh, and I wanted to tell, let everybody know that Karen is still feeling a little bit under the weather. She didn't have her show tonight, but she's getting better, so hopefully we will see her soon. Uh, and I'll be on Wednesday also. Yes. Oh, yes, Barb's new show. Barb, tell us about it. Yeah, I'm going to be, um, I found this, in, I think what's going to be a fantastic, really important read um, on Wednesdays, uh, six starting six Central Eastern Time, uh, it's called Unraveling the Mystery, and uh, I think it's going to be really more deep, fascinating, incredible information coming through. You'll see. I know you'll love it. <laughs> yes, I've heard a little bit of it, and it's really good. You guys need to stick around and and, and listen, and I know you will. Um, but anyway, thanks guys for listening. And uh, please reach out in love, uh, not only to your loved ones, neighbors, or whoever, but to yourself. Uh, Give yourself a big dose of love and acceptance of who you are, and then just step forward in that and keep walking. Uh, We can't change what's happening today. Uh, Some of this stuff is out of our control. There are things happening that... We have no uh, control over whatsoever. The only thing we do have control over is ourselves and how we walk through it. So uh, make it worth I, something to yeah. do so. I just want to say one more thing that I'm not apologizing for what Patty and I are talking about lately uh, because I know you all are grown up out there. I know you all can really um, you know, shift and really transition into what is necessary for you. And, uh, and I don't think that, uh, what the topics that we're, that we're discussing are, you know, are all that horrific, uh, horrific. And, um, that's why we're sharing because we know that it's important for, for everyone. So, yeah, I just want us to say that. Thank you so much, Barb. And huh. she's right, guys. I have to say it, you know, she's right. And, uh, <laughs> we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> All right, Doug. Bye.